Now I'm going to stay very brief in this video. I'm just going to quickly outline what the steps are and why we do them for the systematic treatment of equilibrium. But by and large, the only way to understand systematic treatment of equilibrium is to try it for a couple of problems. Now that said, in class, we'll also do a bit of an activity with systematic treatment of equilibrium. Not quite one of our workshops, but something somewhat similar. Because that's really going to be the only way we can see what goes into it. Now, let's just go ahead and take a look. So step one, first thing we need to do is write down our reactions. And we need to write down anything that's pertinent. And that's going to be a really tough thing for us to do sometimes because we need a lot of chemical intuition for that. You, know, you need to know that if, I don't know, let's see, let's, if you have ammonia, it can interact with water to create ammonium ion and the hydroxide ion. That might not be one that we're always thinking of. Or once we have a, uh, a weak acid, it's going to be able to interact with water to have its conjugate base grab a proton and create some hydroxide ion. You know, so we need to really think through a lot of our reactions. And that's going to be kind of complicated. Now step two, we just saw this one a moment ago, that's our charge balance. And unsurprisingly, three is going to be the mass balance. And what we're trying to do here, and in the next few steps, we're trying to accumulate lots of info. Because what we're going to do later is we're going to start doing tons of cross substitutions until we can finally get a really complicated problem down to the point where there's one variable to solve for. And then once we solve for that, we'll plug it back into all the previous expressions and we can find out the rest of the uh, concentrations and information. That's why it's a complicated approach and it's used for complicated chemistry. All right, so those were steps one, two, and three. Step four, we're going to write down our equilibrium constant. And why would we need to do that? Keep in mind, our equilibrium constant is going to have all of our products for one of the key expressions and all of our reactants as well. And then of course we're going to be able to rearrange our charge balance and our mass balance to plug in just, uh, to, uh, rearrange these to have just one of these letters, substitute that in, and now D has disappeared from our expression, now everything's in the context of A, B, and C and maybe G, E, and F. So we keep on substituting things from these until we get everything into the form of A, C, and B, and then we keep rearranging until we get it down to just A and B, then we rearrange it until finally we get it down to A, or any one of those letters. But that's going to be the fun part, is just substituting stuff back and forth until finally we can solve for just one of these species. Now, step five is where we make sure that we have the info we need. So we're going to count the number of ex expressions we have. And we're going to count the number of unknowns. Now, as long as we have at least as many expressions as we have unknowns, we can substitute around until we can finally get things down to one variable, and then we're set to solve. If not, we have to then use our chemical intuition to say, let's make an assumption about one more of our unknowns. We'll pretend that it's a known, and we'll chop down our unknowns until the expressions match it. Now you might do that by locking in a pH using a buffer, you might say, well, yes, but this concentration is going to be incredibly tiny compared to other concentrations, so let's just ignore it for now. It could be, 
hey, this expression, this concentration is going to be so massive that let's just assume that it's in excess and that it's like the number never changes. You know, maybe the rest of your reaction is working on the millimolar scale and you got a reagent that's at 10 molar. Oh no, you reacted away one millimolar out of 10 molar. You just shrug and say, now it's still 10 molar. That kind of an expression uh, assumption is what you can do to cut down your unknowns. And then step six is where the magic really happens. This is where we just sit and play cards and solve. Now, definitely look through an example, a couple of examples of this. Uh, in the 8th edition, they start on page 153. And the examples we have in our textbook goes, oh, let's see, all the way up to page 158. So you get an impression right away that there's going to be a lot of back and forth on these. Every now and then, later in the chapters that we're going to get to in the future, they'll say, oh, and look, we need to go back and use systematic treatment of equilibrium. Thing is, by and large, in a problem set you're given, I need to give you the reactions, or the homework set does, or whatever, because there's just going to be so many possibilities that we shouldn't necessarily already have a PhD in a specific reaction's interaction with the world. We will be able to do charge balance. We'll be able to do mass balance. We'll be able to do K. You should be able to do the counting, but counting is generally fairly uninteresting. The solving part can take long periods of time to do. So if I give you one like this on an exam, uh, things with systematic treatment will typically be a little bit simpler. They probably won't have too many reactions in them, and it's something that you should be able to solve in a tractable amount of time. But make sure that you do lots of example problems of this in our homework sets, in your textbook, and all those things, because it's one thing to say I'll only give you ones you can solve in short amounts of time. It's another thing to have the practice to be able to solve it in a short period of time. If you don't have that practice, no matter how simple the problem is, it's going to be messy enough you won't get it done. So make sure you get the, pot, uh, the practice in that you need.